This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of world-class software like PDF Pen for Mac, PDF Pen Pro for Mac, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander for Mac, and Text Expander for iPhone and iPad. Learn more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. And by Mac Stock Conference and Expo and the Midwest Mac Barbecue, coming to Woodstock, Illinois on July 16 and 17. Join me along with a host of great speakers, including Mac Roundtable members Victor Kayao of the Terratech Podcast, Adam Christensen of the MacCast, Don McAllister of Screencasts Online, and Allison Sheridan of the NoSillaCast. Learn more and register at MacStock2016.com. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac Community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. The guy on the other side of the screen is Mr. Joe Kissel. Joe, it's great to have you back as always. I'm happy to be here as always. I, I, I love this because this time we're going to talk about Joe's latest book, which is a take control book, but it's not a take control book. It's, it's something kind of new. And yeah. I'm going to I'm going to give Joe the honor of of performing the title. And Joe, <laughs> the title of your new book is "Are Your Bits Flipped? Overcoming Tech Misconceptions." So, the, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I need a sound effect in there of some kind, but I'll, I know I'll figure it out later. It's, are it's, are it's your subtitles in? So, are, are your so bits flipped? Yeah. So it's like I don't know if you've seen this like viral thing about the all all the different actors doing doing lines from Hamlet and it's like to be or not to be to be or not to be um, so so wait we have this we have a title that ends in a question it's are your bits flipped and that's a weird thing to do um, I, it's it's hard to talk about the book because it's like I'm saying hey I have this book uh, what's the title are your bits flipped maybe but what's the title of the book you know and it's just like <laughs> so anyway it's a book that ends in a question mark and there's a subtitle which is which is overcoming tech misconceptions, and that's really it, that's what it is. That's what the book is. But we thought that would be kind of a boring title, so the fun title is "Are Your Bits?" <laughs> and uh, so this is a. I mean, this is out by Take Control, but it is, it's not a Take Control book, obviously. That's right. Because... So it's 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 published by Tidbits Publishing Inc. It is uh, you know available from Take Control Books and, and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't have the words Take Control anywhere in the title. And it used, hey, we're using a different font and a different layout, and we have a different kinds of ways of dealing with graphics, and it's just like, it's it's a new thing. It doesn't look like a Take Control book, except sort of the cover is kind of Take Control-ish, and, um, but, but it's, we're, 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 we're branching out, we're, we're trying something new. And, um, and this is, this is different, but it's, it's fun. And I think it's interesting. And I think it'd be really, uh, appropriate and relevant to the people who like, uh, tidbits and like take control books and, and like this, uh, this podcast. Okay. So with, with that introduction, um, I'm kind of curious because you, the underlying, the subtitle is, is about tech misconceptions. Uh, what tech misconceptions are, are we covering here? Is it is it pretty much limited to our usual fare of, of Mac and Apple s s equipment, or is it a little broader than that? It is broader than that. Um, you know, technology <laughs> technology can go really, really broad, as, as we've discussed in the past. Um, uh, so for the purpose of this book, we are we are restricting the realm. Not, I mean, we're not talking about um, airplanes, which technology. We're not talking about martial arts, which involve technology. We're talking about, you know, computers and smartphones and tablets and those sorts of things, mostly. Um, there are a few chapters in the book that are really just for Apple users. Um, things that are that are strictly about something that will happen on a Mac or that will happen, you know, on an iOS device. Um, but most of the chapters are, are platform agnostic. Just as I've written a number of books that are multi-platform, my book on you know passwords and Dropbox and online privacy and you know many others, uh, this is the same way. It's it it covers things that I have heard about, that people have asked me about, that that I uh, have seen, I've witnessed in person, that I know are common uh, misconceptions about technology, and. I, I hope that the, I hope it attracts a, a broad audience. If you have never touched an Apple device in your life, that's that's fine for the purpose of this book. There will be a couple of chapters that you know you read the introduction to the chapter and you think, yeah, maybe I'll just skip this one, which is fine. 
On the other hand, if you use exclusively Apple devices, there's lots and lots here for you. And if you use a mixture, it's all good. So it's more or less the same kinds of things that I have uh, written about before, but I do try to make it as, as broad and inclusive as possible while keeping it within the sort of, you know, computers and, and, and mobile devices realm because I could, I could go on for hundreds and hundreds of pages about technological misconceptions broadly construed, but I had to kind of stop someplace. Joe, where did this idea come from? I, I mean, obviously, your, your interest in technology, your interaction with people would be the natural springboard. But I feel like there, there had to be something that kind of pulled the trigger on this idea. Yeah, well, I'm going to answer this question in a couple of ways. I'm going to reach for uh, an object here. This is a telephone. Uh, but if, if you sort of, you know, pull it back there and squint it a little bit, you might think this looks a lot like a remote control. I mean, a remote control has, you know, a keypad and sometimes a screen and it's about this size and about this shape. Um, and, and I, so, you know, I have kids <laughs> and I notice, you know, when my kids are like two years old and, uh, they encounter an object that looks like this, they don't know whether to point it at the TV and push a button or hold it up like this and talk on it. They, they, they see a little, little box with buttons and it's all one category for them. And uh, eventually they, they sort out what the difference is. But when I notice how my kids interact with gadgets, you, it's like almost like you can just see those wheels turning in, in real time. You're like, okay, so he picks it up, he pushes a button, he points at a TV, nothing happens. Hmm. So you can, you can kind of suss out what the, what the mental models are. And then, you know, when, when that light bulb goes on, it's like, oh, there's a difference between this device and that device. And here's what the difference is. And, and this works for this purpose. And this works for this purpose. Then, then you're like, okay, now, now the mental model of, of what's going on in the world is, ha, has been refined a bit. It's more accurate. Now, you know, the next day the kid is going to encounter some other electronic gadget that's going to be, you know, that much different. And, and so th this has to get sort of refined and refined and refined. Okay. So I noticed my kids doing this, but I also noticed that at a certain point, adults uh, tend to stop doing this. <laughs> they sort of, th their categories get locked in and they stop sort of wondering. And so they'll jump to a conclusion about what's going on inside that black box. And the conclusion might be a little bit off, but then they, they base all their decisions about how to interact with this black box on those faulty models. And then everything just gets screwed up. So, uh, so one answer to the question is I, I noticed what my kids were doing and I thought, well, this would be a, a cool inspiration for some tidbits articles. So I did write a series of articles for tidbits called flipped bits. And each article was about one of these common tech misconceptions. And so um, some of those articles have found their way in a revised form into this book. And there's a lot of other stuff too. The other answer to your question though, is that I love reading books like this one. This is called You Are Not So Smart. And this one, this is predictably irrational. And lots of others, you know, Freakonomics and various sequels to that. There, there are all these books out there whose basic theme is, you're wrong. <laughs> you're just, you're wrong. You, I'm not going to blame you because almost everybody is wrong, but the, the human brain has certain tendencies and uh, it is so easy for us to get screwed up about, you just like, very common things. I actually have an appendix in the book that is a list of a bunch of other books about the ways in which you are probably wrong. You have misconceptions, whether it's about history or science or whatever. Um, very, very common misconceptions. I love reading these books. I'm like, oh man, I totally do that. I didn't realize I did that until you put it out to me, but yes, you're right. I absolutely totally do that. I suck. And it's okay because now I notice this about myself. I realize I have this tendency and the next time I encounter that situation, I'm going to be a little bit smarter. I'm not going to make the same mistake. And, um, and I, and I, and I love doing that. So, so this is a book for 
people who who have made educated guesses about how technology works just in their ordinary course of life you know just you, you know you use your devices you check your email and you watch your web videos and you do whatever and you say well okay uh, i i think you know i'm pretty sure that in, inside my iMac there there must be a hamster running around on a wheel because you know it makes this rattling sound and <laughs> when I do this that goes and when I you know, do this other thing it doesn't go and then you know you you try to now like pour water into your iMac to feed you know so in case the hamster gets thirsty and then then you know the wrong thing happens obviously that is I'm I'm joking. No, I hope nobody is pouring water into their IMAX. But, but y you have an idea of what's going on inside the box, the app, the cloud service, the computer, whatever. And the idea is not right. Um, it's not stupid. It just isn't right. Um, and so, uh, I, I'm, I want to clear up some of the common misconceptions, but I also want to help you sort of think about things better. I, I wish I could like immunize you against having metaphorical bits flipped, which I should explain, by the way, it's, you know, computers deal with ones and zeros. A bit is either a one or a zero. And every letter, number, word, paragraph, instruction that your computer deals with is just a series of ones and zeros. And it turns out if you get even one of those ones wrong, there's a one where a zero should be or a zero where a one should be, one, one bit is flipped, then you can have the totally wrong results. So for example, if you if you look at the word win, W-I-N in binary, like all those zeros and ones, and then you look at the word sin, also in binary, there's just one bit difference. There's just one bit different between a win and a sin. And and there are so many things like that. So so this is a book to help you keep your bits from being flipped. That example s explains my behavior on Saturday nights occasionally. But anyway, um, yeah, sorry. Um, just, I, your audience, the Take Control audience, my audience here, is probably the perfect audience for this. We, we are constantly getting asked to explain things. And, and we all run into those people who, you know, you just want to say, look, just here's the way to solve your problem. But why? Yeah. And, 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 and we're not necessarily always good at explaining it. We understand it, or at least we think we understand it, and you try, but we're not good at explaining it. So th this sounds kind of interesting, but I'm, I'm curious as to what kind of, some specific examples, I don't want you to recite the whole book, but some specific examples of things that you think are common misconceptions that you're trying to straighten out. Sure. Uh, well, there are many. Uh, many topics, many chapters. Again, some of these have appeared in sort of earlier forms and tidbits. Uh, and you know, <laughs> our our collective audience has heard me talk many times about things like passwords and cloud storage and backup. So of course those topics come up in the book. We shan't say anything <laughs> more about them. Uh, also, you know, online privacy and misconceptions about who you can trust and you know whether you're talking about trusting a person or a company or a technology, under what circumstances can you trust them? Can you trust a, tri a privacy policy? Can you trust a company not to sell my data to somebody else? Can you trust uh, a secure website or internet connection or VPN or whatever not to leak my data? There, there are so many level levels and layers of trust there. Do talk about some misconceptions around email, about IMAP versus POP and changing email addresses and what your domain name might say about you. I talk about, uh, here's, so here's, I, I had this, this actual experience and I, I have to like read what I wrote to, to, because I will get the story wrong if I don't read it. Okay. So I'm, I'm at Starbucks and, uh, there's a woman sitting next to me. She also has a MacBook pro and I'm on the, the Star, Star, uh, Starbucks Wi-Fi, and she's having trouble connecting. And uh, so she asked me for help, and she's she's in Firefox, and Firefox isn't doing the right thing, like connecting to their portal and whatever. So I say, well, you know, why don't you try Safari or Chrome? So here's what she did. She opens a new Finder window. She types the word Chrome in the search field of the Finder window, and she finds no matches. So she concludes she doesn't have Chrome. So she tries typing Safari 
in the search field. Now she finds too many matches and none of them are the right thing. So she instead goes to the sidebar and clicks Applications. She scrolls down to Safari. She drags the Safari icon to her dock. And then she clicks the Safari icon to open it. And I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going like this, like, look, she opened Safari. She succeeded in doing the task. Her method worked for her, but it was so painful for me to watch. And like, I, I didn't want to like sit there and, and, you know, explain, no, 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 you do it this way. Like, I, I, I don't want to be that guy. Right. Uh, but, but it was, it was really hard for me to, 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 to watch. And, and I, and I sort of inferred from what she was doing that she had some misconceptions about how the, the different possible ways of opening an app. So I, I wanted to explain, did you know that there are all these ways of opening an app? So I, I, I don't want you, let, let's just say, so I was having a conversation about this topic with a well-known personality in the Mac community that we all know, and I'm not going to name names, tempting, tempting as that is. So I said, of course, now when I want to open an app, I do this. Now, I hope so, so it, it, there, there's this gesture that involves two thumbs, left thumb, right. Okay, so this could be uh, command space bar to open spotlight search window, or to open launch bar, Alfred, Quicksilver, one of those kinds of you know Butler, one of those kinds of uh, launcher apps. When I want to open an app, I do this. It is the simplest possible gesture. It, it, it's just you know drilled into my muscle memory, two thumbs, two thumbs, two thumbs. And the little thing pops up. I type a letter or two. I hit return. The thing opens. I don't, I don't think about where it's located. I don't wonder. I don't care. It's not important to me. I don't have to know how to spell it or anything. I just, oh, I want Safari. The S return. There it is. So I was explaining this to well-known tech personality and he or she said, two thumbs. I never thought of that. And I'm like, seriously? I thought this was the most obvious thing in the world. It, what, what how, what, how, how else would you do, do what, what, what do you do? I didn't want to know. What do you do instead? Do you, <laughs> do you mouse up to the spotlight? Oh, nope, missed it. A little more. Oh, there to click. And now go to the keyboard and type. Or do you, like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it was that, that this person did instead. To, to open apps, but this seemed like a revelation that now it just two thumbs. That's how I do it. So I, I, I maybe had the flipped a bit, the misconception that everybody knows this, everybody does this, but I really hope that by, by the end of reading this chapter, you have seen the, the, the virtue of, of this, of just, this is how, this is how we're going to do things from now on. Cause it's so much easier than the dozen other ways that I list to open an app. I, I don't want to upset you, so just be calm. But when you did this, yeah, I had no idea what you were doing. Ah. Be because, and I had to put my hands down on the keyboard, and yep, he's right, two thumbs. Right. Because it's so drilled into my muscle memory, too, that I, I didn't even you recognize even that. It. Yeah, you, you yeah. just, that's, that's, that's what my hands do to do what you need to do. So, yeah. so, so there are kind of a bunch of things in the book like that. Some, some stories about like incredibly painful procedures I have heard of people using to search the web. Misconceptions about how URLs work. Uh, so, so many kinds of confusion about, about URLs. Um, email attachments. Oh, good grief. I, I've had, I, and, and, and I have to say, when it comes to email attachments, this is a good example. I've written about Apple Mail, you know, lots of books, lots of articles, but then I get questions and people say, okay, but this thing isn't working for me, or you didn't explain this well enough, or yeah, I, I liked your book, except I still don't understand that. And a lot of these questions I go, wow, it just, it just never would have occurred to me that anyone would have wondered about that because I never wondered about that. Now I know people are wondering about that. So this book 
is, is based on all that feedback from many, many books and articles that I've written and people have left comments or they've written email to me or whatever. They've, you know, snagged me at a conference and said, yes, but, but what about this? And, oh, well, I can see why that would be confusing to you. So let me see if I can unconfuse you. Um, and it's just a bunch of, uh, a bunch of chapters on stuff like that. One thing I wanted to, you mentioned, and I've, I wanted to ask you to pursue it just a little bit. Don't give us the full chapter, but because okay. um, I'm pretty sure I know where you're going to go with this. But what your domain name says about you, because yeah. I, th I, I think, I mean, I ran into this recently uh, with some people, and, and I just shake my head, and, and it's like, really? Let's see, 2016, and <laughs> that's what you're using for a domain name? Yeah, and you know. Obviously, I have opinions, and I express my opinions in the book, and my opinions may not be the same as other people's opinion or or your opinion. So we'll, we'll bracket it that way. I'm going to give an example. So uh, let's say you know my my local internet provider here is Cox Cable. Uh, now I know that there are some of my neighbors who really love Cox and have used Cox forever. And others who just hate Cox, you know, you know, very, very much opposed to them and use them only because, you know, they don't have a choice or it's the least least bad option. They could use AT and T, but something, or they could use Time Warner, but something. Else. Okay. So when when you sign up for home internet connection, you know, cable modem, what a connection with with Cox, you get a you get an email address, you know, like your name at cox.com or cox. I don't even know. But anyway, it's 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 your your own email address in the ISP's domain. Now I have one, I have never ever used it. Uh, but I know people who who have gotten email addresses from their internet provider and they use those and they have used them for years or even decades. Now, when when somebody said I say what's your email address and they say, "Oh, well, I'm, you know, so and so at something something dot, you know, twc, you know, time warner cable dot something like that or something dot comcast dot net or whatever." When it's an ISP's email address, I, I, I get sad, and 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 I think you may not realize it. It's not that you have intentionally done something wrong or anything, but do, do you know that you've painted yourself into a corner? So over the period of years, you give out your address to hundreds, maybe thousands of people. You you entered on all these different websites, and you know banks and companies and friends and relatives all have this address. Okay, well, what if? someday you need to move and your new home is not in the service area that that provider uh, supports, you can't use that email address anymore. Or what if someday uh, you a, a competitor comes along and says, oh, hey, get rid of Comcast, get rid of Cox, we will offer you Hundred times better speed, half the price, fiber, some new wireless technology, whatever. You say, I'd love to, but then you know, then I would have to give up this email address with my with my ISP, and I have to you know write hundreds of email messages telling everybody that, and that I could forget somebody, and I would miss important email. So no, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep I'm gonna stick with my sucky, expensive internet provider because I, I wedded myself to their email address. So I, I think that, that you know, you, you, if you instead had used Gmail or iCloud Mail or got your own domain name that you use for mail or any of a thousand other options, then it would be portable. You, portable from one ISP to another. You can move from one house to another, doesn't matter. Nobody will know the difference on the internet. Your email address can go with you. You can even move from one email provider to another. Your email address can come with you, at least if you have your own domain. And so it just makes me sad when people are sort of, number one, advertising that they have painted themselves into a corner with their ISP, and number two, advertising the ISP. So if you have a Gmail address, then every 
email you send advertises Google. Google does not need any free advertising. And if you if you use a Cox.com address, then every email you send advertises Cox. And frankly, even if you use iCloud, every email you send is going to advertise Apple. And these companies don't need your help. Um, I, I wouldn't give them free advertising. I would love to advertise my own business, thank you very much. And so I use my own domain name so that every email I send advertises me and not some other company. So I want... I want people to be aware of what their email address says about them that they may not realize. And if they find themselves painted into a corner, what to do about it. So that's an example of one of the things I talk about in the book. This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of world-class software like PDF Pen for Mac, PDF Pen Pro for Mac, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander for Mac, and Text Expander for iPhone and iPad. Learn more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Smile has just released Text Expander 6, an update to their text expansion utility that boasts quite a few new changes to one of my favorite productivity apps. Now, Text Expander comes with its own cloud service, TextExpander.com, to help you share and sync your snippets. Yes, I said share and sync your snippets. Snippet sharing is an exciting new feature from Smile. Not only are your snippets synced between your Mac and iOS devices for your own use, but you can share your snippets with your family to help improve their productivity and solve their problems. With Text Expander's new Teams capability, you can implement snippet sharing for your team at work. Pick which snippets you want to share with which team members edit them on the fly, and simplify and standardize email responses, social media comments, pieces of code for websites, automatic spelling and capitalization correction, and much, much more. Of course, all the Text Expander legacy usefulness hasn't changed. Email signatures, blocks of code or text, images, snippet groups, and more are all still there, right where you expect them. Text Expander 6 is an intriguing update to a utility that I use multiple times an hour when I'm on my Mac, iPad, or iPhone. I'd like you to find out what it can do for you by visiting smilesoftware.com and learning more about it. That's Text Expander 6 from Smile, the makers of world class software at smilesoftware.com. Thanks to Smile for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. How do you feel that, about people that still use AOL as their gateway to the internet? <laughs> you know, <laughs> careful. I, I do talk about this. We, we we both have to be careful here because we're going to alienate some people. Well, you know, I'm getting hot. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I will say about AOL that number one, it, it is portable across ISPs. So the fact, you know, if you used to use AOL for dial-up, and you've decided that you are not going to use dial-up anymore, it's okay. You can keep your AOL address and you can use, you know, whatever ISP you want and continue to, to use AOL just for email. That's possible. But a lot of people don't know is that they can do this for free. They don't, if, you, if you're not using AOL for dial-up anymore, you don't have to pay them anymore. You can switch to a free email-only account and not keep giving AOL your money. AOL will gladly take your money even if you never ever use their dial-up service just because you've been in the habit of giving it to them all these years. But you don't have to do that anymore and please don't. So I, I will say there, there are worse things. Um, I do worry because I know people who continue to pay AOL for dial-up even when they don't need or use dial-up just because they want to hang on to that AOL address. So I know that there are people like that. I wish I, wish I could convince you not to, <laughs> but I think there are much better addresses that a person could have. And I, 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 I think the very best kind of address is one in a domain that you personally own, then you can do whatever with it you want. But failing that, at least go for something that is generic and portable and that is not going to require you to keep paying a particular company for years and years and years and years. I, I, sound advice, sound advice. The same thing for people, and, and I see people that that make their, their, their work address, but not of work that they own, 
they use it for personal personal communications and that's just such a bad idea for so many reasons because first of all your employer probably won't be happy with it but if you suddenly get walked to the door for whatever reason circumstances beyond your control guess what your 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 email 99.9 percent .9 of the time gets cut off then right then and you're done yeah well you know <laughs> even though this this book isn't titled take control something I really do believe in empowering people. I want, I, I would, I would like for all of us to feel like we have control over the technology that we rely on. It, it's one thing if you're using a service and you know, it's, it's something that you do for work and it's out of your hands, but for something that you depend on as, as crucially as email, if you can have control over it, and of course you can, I, I really think you should. And I, I, I do, and you know, in all of my books, whether they're branded as take control or not, I encourage that mindset of thinking through what, what would need to happen in order for you to really control this and have, have the, the capability and the authority to make changes and, and follow that path. Somehow we got off on, on email as I guess is a perfect example. And it's something we both can identify with and a lot of people can yeah. identify with. Give us just a couple of examples of maybe some some non computer oriented stuff that's in the book. I mean, we don't need to go too far down the road, but just some ideas of other things. Yeah, so the the very first chapter is is quite a long chapter. I kind of alluded to it earlier, but it's it's about trust. And trust is this really slippery word because I hear people talking a lot about whether or not, and especially with like all the stuff that's been going on with Apple versus FBI and Apple versus other kinds of law enforcement and all this talk about encryption and that, that kind of thing. Uh, I really hear a lot of talk about whether you can trust Apple, whether you can trust Google, whether you can trust Dropbox, whether you can trust 1Password. But people mean different things when they talk about trust. So when you're talking about encryption, for example, there's, there's one viewpoint that, well, I trust the technology because I know that this particular encryption algorithm is open source and it's been vetted by hundreds, thousands of really smart engineers and it's been really tested very thoroughly. And I know that this is a secure encryption technology. So that's, that's one sort of trust where you're trusting in the technology itself. And there's a different kind of trust where you're trusting in a person. So I trust you. I mean, I, you, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, I think you're a trustworthy person. I think you're honest. I think you are, you know, morally upright. Um, I, I would, I would probably trust you to, you know, like watch my house when I'm out of town. If in some alternate universe where I had a house in your neighborhood, uh, but. Honestly, if I have a toothache, I would not trust you to uh, do oral surgery on me. You know, I mean, we all have, we, no matter how much you trust a person, there's, there's limits, there's, there's domains in which we trust them. Well, I trust you to watch my kids, but not to, you know, give me medical advice. I trust you to give me tax advice, but not to watch my kids, you know, like, so, and, and that's as it should be. Now, when you, when you say, well, I trust Google, they're not going to give away my personal information. I'm like that doesn't even make, that's a, and I don't, I don't even understand the words that you have put together. That doesn't even <laughs> seem like English to me. Google is not a person. Like if Google were a person, I would still have to say, I trust them with this, but not with that. But Google's not a person. Google is thousands and thousands of people. Are you saying you trust all of them? Are you saying you trust every contractor that might randomly come in for a day and do something stupid? Are you tr are you saying that none of their, you know, computers or in their massive data centers are ever going to randomly break down? Well, th those aren't logical. Those aren't reasonable things to trust. Of course, people are going to do stupid things, and computers are going to break down. So. When you talk about whether or not a certain thing should be trusted, a company, a technology, a person, an app, a cloud service, a device, you, 
you, you need to sort of tease apart all those different things. What exactly do I mean when I say I do trust this or that I don't trust this? And I, I think a lot of people are, are sort of on the excessively trusting end of the scale. And there are also a lot of people on the excessively paranoid end of the scale. And my statement in the book is that trust is not absolute and it's not binary. It's not an either or thing. It depends. It depends on a lot of stuff. And it's a big deal because when you're deciding, you know, what, what company am I going to pay money to, to protect my backups or uh, my passwords or my money or whatever, it, it is a big deal to know whether and to what extent and in what ways you can trust them. So I have, the, have this very long sort of philosophical meditation on trust that helps to just sort of, you know, take, take this one very mushy, slippery word and separate it out into all the sort of atomic concepts. So you can say, oh, yes, well, it's, it's really okay for me to say I don't trust my wife if that's followed by to pilot an airplane <laughs> because my wife isn't a pilot okay <laughs> okay glad you um, glad you got that last part in there joe yeah. so <laughs> okay that's 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 good that gives some folks some idea of what they're getting into with this book yeah. uh it sounds like you had a lot of fun with this book joe i i did i have to say <sighs> it's a weird book because i wasn't doing the sort of usual thing where just like okay they're I have this complicated process and I'm going to break it down and explain all the steps one at a time. It is, it does have a lot of opinion in it and it does have a lot of sort of these higher level concepts there. I mean, there's a bit of like step-by-step -step stuff, but there's a lot of that that I just sort of yada yada because that's not the point of the book. The point of the book isn't to say here are the exact, exact steps for clearing your cookies in browser X or something. It's, uh, you know, whether you should care about cookies or not, more more that sort of thing. So as a result, we had a number of people give feedback on the manuscript. Some were looking at, at a more, you know, technical, like, am I telling the truth? Is, is this accurate? And some were looking at a more, a higher level, like, does this make sense? Did I explain myself well? Did I make a good case? And I have to say, uh, a lot of the comments were challenging for me because whenever you when, whenever opinions come into play and whenever I'm suggesting that you may be doing something wrong that that tends to emotions get involved and even even when I'm just trying to be very very matter of fact about something like well you know, as, as we all know, such and such. And, you know, uh, our reviewers like, Oh, I didn't know that. Or I did know that, but I don't like, you know, I don't like being talked to in that way or whatever. It's, it's, it's tricky to get this stuff right. So, Hey, maybe I'm wrong. That's okay. I give, I give a number of examples in this book of times when my bits have been flipped <laughs> and some of them probably still are and that's okay we we learn as we go uh, i i talk about you know sort of stupid tech mistakes i have made and how i figured out the right thing and maybe it happens by degrees and maybe i am not there yet but as far as i'm concerned all progress is good so if you can be a little clearer now than you were before, maybe you're not perfectly clear, but like you're, you're getting there, that's great. And if I can even inch you forward a bit and inch myself forward a bit by having people point out to me things that I have never noticed before in ways that I might be screwing up, um, I think that's positive. And I, you know, I give the example that like my, my five-year-old is, is learning to read. He's actually, fantastic reader for his age, but we're reading a book together and every once in a while he gets stuck on a word. So I'll say, oh, well, that's enough. And he'll go like, enough? Really? But there's no F in it. And, you know, um, he, he's, still, he's still kind of mystified by this fact that a lot of words don't sound the way they look. But when I explain it to him, he just kind of like, oh, okay, enough. Got it. And he moves on. He doesn't take it personally because he hasn't gotten to the point yet where like his ego is all bound up in, in, in knowing the right things. 
And unfortunately for a lot of adults, that, that is the case. So I, I just want for, for readers to say, hey, you know, let's, let's not have any judgment about this. If I'm right, I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If Kissel is wrong, I will gently and politely point it out to him. <laughs> But we, we don't have to make a big deal about being wrong. Being wrong, you know, noticing that you're wrong means that you'll be right the next time. You've just gotten smarter, and that's really the goal. And I think all of us tend to, we want to be right, and the technology is so complex, and now there's so much of it. We've talked about this, that you can't be an expert on everything. You know, I, I have no compunction. I, I don't I don't remember how to do certain things on my Mac. I have to go to Google or, or punch up something, and, and oh, that's... That's right. That's how you do that, you know. So that's just kind of the way it is. And, and I, I th so I think it's a great way to approach this. It's it's a it's a humorous way, attack some of this, and and maybe make us all more comfortable with the fact that we don't know everything. We shouldn't know everything, and maybe you can teach us a little more so we get there. Sure. Well, yeah. you know, I've frequently had the experience where I don't remember how to do something, and I Google it. And I find this really great article that, that spells it all out. I was like, oh, I wrote that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I forgot that I wrote it because that was, you know, years ago or whatever. I, I keep cheat sheets for myself. I figure out how to do something, then I write it down because I know that the next time I need to know that information is going to be six months from now and I will have forgotten by then. So, and the fact that you're smart enough to write it down because you, yeah. you realize that is half the battle. I, I, I think so. Because I don't do it as often as I should. And then I got to go back and go through the rediscovery process instead of just taking that extra minute and a half to jot, jot a note somewhere that I can find. There's, there's, no, there's no shame in any of this. There's no judgment. I mean, admittedly, I do tell some stories about people in the book that I really hope that most readers are going to go, oh, you can't be serious. Somebody really did that. Yeah, somebody really did that. I, I hope that there's more eye rolling than, um, oh, well, of course I go through those 10 steps to open every app. <laughs> Isn't that normal? Um, but even if you see yourself, if you're not like in on the joke and you're like laughing with me, even if you see yourself in some of these things, there's, there's no, like, I don't know. That's, I didn't. I didn't know you were doing that. I didn't know that you didn't know what to do with your two thumbs. So <laughs> it's fine. There's no judgment there. Um, I would rather have you learn a, a new trick and and be able to do something easier the next time. And then there will be something else, and we'll both learn. So how how many pages? The the usual take or excuse me, the usual book stuff. I'm not going to say take control stuff. The usual book stuff. Yeah. Um, so as as of the moment we are recording this. Uh, Tanya is still experimenting with fonts and spacing and things like that. So I'm not exactly sure of the final page count. The last version of the manuscript I saw was 172 pages. So it's kind of in that ballpark. It's a $15 ebook, as usual, you know, combine it with other take control books for a discount and uh, available at takecontrolbooks.com. Uh, I, I hope that. I hope that you love it. And if you don't love it, I'm sure that you will tell me. I would like to think that the feedback is along the lines of, of what I've heard during editing, which is like, you know, this, this story about opening apps reminds me of this. Joe, you ought to put a little sidebar in the book about this. So I put a little sidebar in about that. And oh, you know, it's, it's too bad we don't have time to add another chapter because uh, another chapter on this thing would be great. Hey, if I get that kind of feedback, then th later on there can be a second edition and we add more chapters. We talk about more tech misconceptions. I can go on. I mean, I, I cut out, I don't know, four or five chapters that were in the outline just because like the book was getting so long and I had to, I had to finish it. I had to stop. But I, I hope the feedback is like, oh, this is good. In fact, here's something else you ought to talk about. I'm looking forward to it. I, I have not seen the book yet. Um, and and now I'm really anxious to see it because I'm I'm almost afraid of some of the things that I'm probably doing because I I do the same thing you do I look over people's shoulders especially when they use their computers, and sometimes you you just you try to hold it back but you just can't it's like why are you doing that why do you close every app to move to the next one and then go back and open the first one why don't you just put a couple windows up but you know and it, it's it's I mean they still get the job done it's just like That's you say it's painful. 
that's right. It, it, we, we can we can only do what we can do to to gently and respectfully say, "Have you considered this?" Yeah. I I have. I, I'm sure I've probably told you before, and we'll probably tell you again that we have a rule in this household that one may not begin a sentence with the words "Why don't you just?" Because those words are judgmental, and they they are they are they are a code for you are stupid. <laughs> You're not doing the obvious thing, and I am clearly much smarter than you. Why don't you just do the obvious thing? Well, if it was obvious to me, then I would have done it, wouldn't I? You know, or maybe I have a good reason for not doing it that you are not smart enough to know about. So, we 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 try not to take that approach. If you don't know why I'm mad at you, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> And, and my head explodes. Right. So I think the next book needs to be on relationship advice, Joe. Well, um, that would be very interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I could write advice. I. Why don't you jest? I, why don't I jest? That's <laughs> well, you know. So I had. I, I don't mean to get off on a tangent here and rant, but oh, go. <laughs> Just for fun. The things have. I, I've been writing books. I've been like. So I, I have I have a life, and my life is very full and complex, and things are going on with my family and my kids and my work, and the the details of that aren't aren't don't need to be public. But the point is that I I I keep very busy, and with every decision I make about how to spend my time, it's the best decision I can make at that moment. So, uh, a person who has read a lot of my stuff and, and bought a lot of my books writes and says, "Hey, you know, Joe." Haven't seen many new articles on JoeOnTech.net lately. What's what's that? Why don't you, you know, come on, you know, let's let's get writing there. As as though I spend all my days, you know, just standing in front of my computer saying, Yeah, I think I'm gonna come up with something, some excuse today to not write a new article for my website. Hmm, boy, there must be some game I can download or some way I can goof off to avoid doing the obvious thing, which is to write an article for my website. And it, it isn't like that at all. I mean, what, when I do something or don't do something, I have a really good reason for it. And I'm sorry that you're not seeing exactly what you want and the speed that you want it to occur, but you know, have, have a little bit of, have a little bit of grace. <laughs> and so they, they love you, Joe. They just want more. Yeah. They can't get enough. Now, now I've got the Depeche Mode song in my head. Thank you very much. That's going <laughs> to... <laughs> with, with that, we'll let Joe get back to doing things and writing. Joe, thank you. This, this has been... As, it's fun as always, but this is going to be a fun book. I'm looking forward it to it. I'm cool. looking forward to it. So one more time, Are Your Bits Flipped? Are Your Bits Flipped? And at TakeControlBooks.com. That's right. He's Joe Kissel. Uh, check him out on Twitter. Joe, we'll have you back again uh, whenever the next book is up or maybe on the Mac jury, but you're always welcome. Awesome. See you soon. <laughs> Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Uh, I, by the way, I'm Chuck at MacVoices.com. Did you see what I did there? Um, <laughs> until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. Hang on a second. This is just bugging me, so. It's okay. Nobody else will notice, but. <laughs> I, I swear, I'm, this is going to be an outtake. I like this. <laughs> 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 what, a, what a cleaning of the, yeah, I love that. I love that.